Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Meg Tyler, Assistant Professor of Humanities here at the College of General Studies, and also director of this poetry reading series, which is co-sponsored by the University Professors Program and the BU Humanities Foundation. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Greg Delante, who was born in Cork and educated at the National University of Ireland in Cork. He became a U.S. citizen in 1994 and was a Green Party candidate in the Vermont state elections in 2004. <laughs> His publications include American Wake, The Hell Box, The Blind Stitch, and The Ship of Birth. His collected poems, 1986 to 2006, was published in 2007. His anthology, Jumping Off Shadows, Selected Contemporary Irish Poetry, edited with Nuala Ni came out in 1995, and with Robert Welsh, he has edited the selected poems of Patrick Galvin. Among the awards he has received are the Patrick Kavanaugh Award, the Alan Dowling Poetry Fellowship, and the Austin Clark Award. <coughs> His translations of Aristophanes' The Suits and Euripides' Orestes both appeared in 1999. He is artist in residence at St. Michael's College in Vermont. And please, let's welcome Greg Delante. So, is it 52 minutes from now, or is it 52 minutes from you? What do you think? I don't normally, I try always to keep it to about 40 minutes, so, anyway, so that um, for the radio show, which I'm delighted to be on, and, uh, I, I love po poetry on radio, rather than on the video or seeing people, I often think that it, poetry on the video is diverting, because you see the person, and you see, they're very distracting. From, from the reality of the poem, which is a different thing altogether from one's idea of a person who writes the poem. And I vote for all, as it happens now, I, mean, I didn't intend to talk about this actually, but I, I've always not allowed a photograph on my books, because I've often thought, if they saw me, they'd say, how could he write a poem? <laughs> or, which I thought was a compliment, I suppose, if you think about it. It was a bit even more if they looked at you and said, oh God, he must be a very good poet. <laughs> but anyway, um, the first, I'm going to read I just met somebody, Jennifer, as I was trying to fix up my reading before uh, the reading. And uh, I looked at my poems, collected poems, 20 years, and some others, and I didn't, it was one of those days where I couldn't find anything that I liked. So, you know, you, you sing them a bit too much. You know, you go, I've been reading a lot around, and so you get tired of your own poems. So I'll pretend, and maybe I even get to like them as I'm going through them again. Um, but the first poem is an epigraph poem from, <coughs> from the collected poems. Um, it's, it is actually a poem from my next book, which is a, the Greek anthology, book 17. As you know, there is no book 17, and it's all by made up characters, and one of them is Gregory of Carcass. <laughs> News in flight. We fly over the city. The screen flashes current news. Nothing, it seems, but killing and mayhem all round. Daily, we're brought low. How lowly we've fallen. Hardly anyone says a word. Urban lights stretch into the rural night below. Even fewer mention such wonders. The lights are like those of countless fans at a concert, holding up candles to their gods. The group, homo sapiens, fleeting as any. Yet, Gods, nonetheless, bearing mayhem on the one hand and marvels 
on the other, as is the way of any regular band of gods. Um, the, the first poem I read uh, is a poem, I mean the second poem I read, the first poem by me, that was by Great Grave Carcass. <laughs> um, the second poem I read um, is a poem to my mother Eileen. Um, you know, when you were a child, you were given uh, jobs to do in the house. My job, because every one of my jobs, I didn't get that many jobs, I'm to say, um, was to thread the needle for my mother when she was sewing, because the rest of them didn't have great eyes. I, I, you know, so, my, do you understand? So that was one of my jobs. So therefore, the poem came out of that. It's, it's about a page long. And it just occurs to me, actually, that I, I, I've become aware, I tell people now um, how long the poem is so that you know that you know, it's not going to go on for four pages or when is it going to end. <laughs> it does make a difference. I mean, I look always at the next page to see when the poem ends. <laughs> not so much that I have, um, what is it, a short attention span? Though I probably do, and I'm getting more atten short attention span as the time going on, as time goes on. But I, I remember actually, it was Christopher said it to me when David did it, and it was a good. I thought it was. I, I thought it was a good idea. I actually, I, I even extended it, David, and I put up the book and I show it to the audience, <laughs> so that you are physically aware of your, this is not an epic. <laughs> well, what I'm really saying is that you all have atten short attention spans, and I don't. Excuse me. To my mother, I think. There is a word in this called Amadon, which means fool, uh, dull, um, dullard. Yeah, I think it's from Gaelic. To my mother, Eileen. I'm threading the eye of the needle for you again. That is my specially appointed task, my gift that you gave me. Ma, watch me slip this camel of words through. Yes, R rich we are still, even if your needlework has long since gone with the rag and bone man, and Da never came home one day or dad. Work, 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 lose yourself in work. That's what he'd say. Okay, okay, ma, listen, I can hear the sticks of our fire spit like corn turning into popcorn with the brown insides of rotten teeth. We sit in our old sleep mish house. Norman is just born. He's in the pen. I raise the needle to the light and lick the thread to stiffen the limp wards. I pair through the eye, focus, put everything out of my head. I shut my right eye and thread. I'm imparted now, a likely lad instead of the Amadon at dread school. I have the eye, haven't I, the knack? I'm Prince Threather. I missed it that try. Concentrate, concentrate. Enough yakety yak. There, there, ma, look. Here's the threaded needle back. That book is from a book, uh, called The Blind Stitch, and that's the first poem, and the last poem in it, it is a kind of, the book is set, it's a kind of palindrome, subject matter-wise, um, and the last poem, I, my, my feelings about art and life are not un, unlike W.B. Yeats, the great poet W.B. Yeats. For me, they're a palindrome, one doesn't come before the other, they are each other, um, 
and that thus that's part of the idea of the palindrome in the book, the subject palindrome at least. Um, but the last poem is an American sonnet. I'm going to read some American sonnets recently. I mean now, uh, maybe uh, some work on sonnets. And <coughs> these have been called American sonnets, which means that they're just 14 lines and nothing else. Which is, I, this is what I assume they mean, in the sense that they're 14 lines and they're not rhyme, they're not Shakespearean, they're not Petrarchian, and they're not. Um, and they're, they, they, they spread out a bit more. And um, the, bl the blind stitch, um, you know what a blind stitch is, of course. Huh? Do you know what a blind stitch is? I, I didn't either, but when I heard it, I thought they must get a poem out of it. And um, it's the stitch that you can see in your clothes that, you know, so there's a certain stitch you can do and it's inside of the, the, the cloth, the, the cloth, or the, or the sewing. The, sewing. the blind stitch. I can't say why rightly. But suddenly it's clear, once more, what holds us together as we sit recumbent in the old ease of each other's company, chewing the rag about friends, a poem we loved and such like. Your Portuguese skin, set off by a turquoise dress doesn't hinder either. But there's something more than tan deep between us. I saw a button to a vest you made me raveled years ago. You hemmed it with the stitch you meant a frock with now. Our hands, without thought for individual movement, saw in and out entering and leaving at one and the same time. If through be told the thread had frayed between us unnoticed, except for the odd rip, but as we saw, love is in the mending. And though nothing said, we feel it in a lightness of mood or ease or blind stitch. Um, it's a poem about marriage. I mean, the students here now, and I, I'm just thinking, you know, often when you look at your parents, I suppose, and you say, God, I hope that my marriage doesn't turn out like that. There doesn't seem to be any affection between that. Uh, uh, and yet, there is, you know, but it's just more of his, his history and other things involved. Um, it's not the heroin shot of being in love, as it were, the early on, you know. But I thought for a laugh, and I didn't intend to do this. And I see students here, and um, I'm going to read, say the first poem I ever had published. I, I never had it, I never put it in a book. It's called Catching a Girl, it's a woman, like, a girl in my case, who's 17. And, I, and I, I hope I can remember it now, but, uh, and it's, it's not very good. It's okay, do you know what I mean? I wouldn't put it in anything, but, so what, you know? But it's about Catching a Girl, it's like, well, course, there's a story to it. Girl in university that I had a terrible crush on when I went to when I was 17 or 18. So, again, I stand anchor deep in the river and quiver with the placing of bait on the hook of the gut that's cast through the eye in the rod. Through the air, I hear the reel spin and sing, and you hear and turn and stare, and we are caught in space with the weight sending us down and down to a lee's bed sand and unsettled sand drifts. Do you know? So there you are. I know what it's like to be. I still like that a bit. <laughs> but then, um, I'm going to say another poem by another poet now. Um, Patrick Cavanagh, the great Irish poet, um, who in many ways brought the rural world that Seamus, Heaney, and John Montague, great poets, um, into a place where it becomes a literary reality to everybody, recognizable, and at this point, you know, almost conventional. Um, but they also use it, he was the first poet to use it, 
as in the metaphorical sense, the landscape is metaphor. Seamus is the marvelous North poems, um, or his father poems, you know, where his father is the follower, and you know, it could be tradition, you know, where it breaks from the literal into the metaphorical. And, um, you know, I, this was the first, I think, um, Kavanagh had done this, Patrick Kavanagh. It's, it's, a, it's a simple poem, a marvelous poem, called To the Man After the Harrow, where the man is just ha you know, plowing the field, but of course it's metam metaphorical for all of us. To the man after the harrow. Now leave the check reins slack. The seed is flying far today. The seed like summer against the black eternity of April clay. The seed's as potent as the, as the Hebrew book. Uh, I, I tell you, did it, I'll have to start it again. You'll have to change that on the radio. Now leave the check rain slack. The seed is flying far today. The seed like summer against the black eternity of April clay. The seed is potent as the seed of knowledge in the Hebrew book. So drive your horses in the creed of God the Father as it stuck. Forget the men on Brady's hill. Forget what Brady's boy may say. For destiny will not fulfill unless you let the harrow play. Forget the worm's opinion too of hooves and pointed harrow pins, for you are driving your horses through the mist where Genesis begins. Um, the only danger of reading other people's poems, or fabulous poems, while you're reading your own poems is that one feels that you're slumping into your own poems the next thing. <laughs> um, but I'm going to read a metaphorical poem. Uh, again, another American sonnet. Uh, I have the equivalent in Ireland, it's called The West, but this is called Loose Drive, um, from page 225. Um, and it's a poem, you know, I have a, I have a lot of poems what people call political poems or public poems, but for me they're private poems reacting to public things. I mean, I, I, I can't see why it's more, not more public than love or poems about your parents, do you understand? Um, but, um, you know, the man, maybe you do, 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 do I, I, I'm speaking now to some of the younger people, do you know Loose Drift? Do you know what it is? Uh, it's, it's the, a lot of, you, you don't know, it, it, it's, it's one of those, plants that has been brought in and is destroying all the native vegetation. It's a beautiful plant. Do you understand? And it's growing all over New England and it's, you know. So, of course it becomes metaphorical. And the poem before it is, is a poem called Us or the US. And the last word in this is Us or the US. I, I say these things, I would not normally say them at a reading, but because we're at a university I will say them. Um, there are other tricks that poets do, but I, I won't be so obvious about them. I pretend they're there. But just so that you know, you know, there's always other things going on. But anyway, loose strife. You have become your name, loose strife. Carried on sheep, spurting up out of ballast. A cure brought across the deep to treat wounds, soothe trouble. There have been others like you, the rhododendron, the cattails that you in your turn overrun. Voices praise your magenta spread, your ability to propagate by seed, by stem, by roots, and how you adjust to light, to soil, spreading your glory across the earth. Even as you kill by boat, by air, by land, all before you, the hardy iris, the rare orchids, the spawning ground of fish, you'll overtake the earth and destroy even yourself. Ah, or lose strife. 
purple plate, beautiful os. Um, on that vein, I'm going to. I was going to read another poem, but I'll read another sonnet, um, which is. I, I, you know, it's a sonnet I like, but I don't think it's one of my better poems, do you understand? Um, but it, 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 it's a poem, um, it's a literary poem, I suppose, in many ways. It's a poem I wrote while I was reading uh, W.B. Yeats and Patrick Kavanagh. Yeats' poem, Lavis Lazula. Um, and Kavanagh's poem, about the geese, and you know, it's his poem, the poem says it. A lot of my poems, when I write them in sonnets, are to do with complicity about being alive, which is, you know, you know we're all complicit now, whether we like it or not, even if you're living in Ireland, or west of Ireland, or Europe, or, do you understand? In general, you can't buy something without somebody else being affected, it's often badly, so, you know. Um, but also, this is a reaction to the more grander views of very fine poets, great poets, whatever great means, poets that last, and their body of work lasts. In times of war. So, the monocled poet delights in the two Chinamen, seated there on the cracked, lofty, lavish blue slopes under snowdrops of cherry blossom. Their serving man caresses plaintive strings as the wise myops in the cute little halfway house sipping green tea stare on all the tragic scene. Their ancient eyes glitter gay. Over them flies the spindly-legged bird, longevity, croaking in the mind, all will be okay, okay, elsewhere, a bit along the rocky slope, and of a par. Another poet eulogizes geese flying in fair formation to inch a core, how their wings will outwing the war. Oh, my two poets, I stare by. I know my station. But what of the mother stooped over her child? The wild pen over the limp signet, the pen defiled. And now, uh, to something lighter. I have come to the States, I came to the States 20 years ago, and you know, I don't like to talk about Ireland um, in a way that makes it sound simple, because it's definitely not simple and it's a beautiful place. But I will say that when I left, as you may remember, the restaurants weren't great, and we didn't have that many vegetables, and we, we, we didn't like eating them even when we did. <laughs> you know, we had cabbage and we had peas and beans. Do we, do we even consider that? But I was fascinated when I came to the States with all the vegetables you could see on the street, you know, New York and etc. Particularly fascinated by the gourd, because they, I couldn't understand how so many of them, how, how the gourd could look so different, and there are so many and they look so different. And I, I have just a special fascination for the gourd. You might say I'm a bit of a gourd freak. <laughs> but so I got this poem out of it. It's a poem that nobody ever talks about in any review. So therefore, I stand up for it every time. And it's a light. It's light, but maybe perhaps it's not so light too. But uh, do, do you know that you know they're fa different. Anyway, I'm proselytizing now. I shouldn't. The or god. There's something about the god. How each can look so absurd and so different from the other. Compare the egg gourd, say, with the torx turban, or swan with the crown of thorns, pear, a cavesman's club, dolphin, pumpkin, or the serpent inciting sin and knowledge. 
how could they be king? They're as various as their uses. Currencies, condoms, board houses, marimbas, you name it. And the name, the concealed God within. Our God, whispering, we're all the same beneath the rind. The God we scour the earth for on our knees. Our word who art on earth, hallowed be thy God. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, is humor. The next poem, um, I'm going to read from Type is Slaughter, so I think that's just have to go on. Um, Black Snow, another kind of. I was in New York and the snow was down, and it was after kind of. It was gone black, like not like Marcy Panoff, and because of the. the um, what you call it, the suit or the. The atmosphere. Black Snow, short poem. And a reference back to my childhood days is when they were telling us about when we sinned, all our souls would be specked with little black, the venial sins. And of course, when it was a mortal sin, just all black, we were gone. Or we believe this. We really believe. I still believe it somewhere in me, even though I don't believe in, do you understand me? But I still. Possible to explain this to if you weren't there. David points at the two day snow bunkers along Broadway. Not the natural jaundiced yellow of melting slush, but as if a storm of smog snow had fallen. He remarks that's what we breathe in every day. Reminding me of how the nuns described the soul as a flake of snow and every trespass suit darkens that whiteness of whiteness. Ah, the soul of the world is made manifest to us today on Broadway and 82nd. A fuming, black, exhausted snow soul. Woe begun as a bewildered oil slick board, unable to fly. I laugh, not without cynicism and apathetic stoicism. Qualities necessary these days to survive, or rather, get by. Um, This is a poem, um, a little short poem, called uh, The Great Ship. Oh, um, poem I like. I might even like it today. Am I acting well, do I look? Do you know? <laughs> um, but again, you'll excuse me. But for younger people, the great what's the great ship? Can you tell me what the great ship is? The younger people, can you tell me what, the, what was the great ship of the last century? Hmm? Guess, guess. You said it. I think that, like, did you say the Titanic? Yeah. And of course, it's a metaphor for mankind, etc. Do you know? But um, other things too. And humankind, should I say? And when the ship was going down, they sang the song, Near My God to Thee. And of course, even the atheists sang it, if only because the song was a comfort. The great ship. Later, tonight. It's to turn cold. The old, sudden, sharp, iceberg cold of New England 
crickets, cicadas, grasshoppers, and frogs play on what their songs and wing music are saying, I can't say. Except they must know already that the ice has gashed a gaping hole in the hull of Indian summer. And they are the quartet that comes out on deck and plays away as the great ship goes down. We listen quietly from our deck's lifeboat. Play on, brave, noble souls. Play on, near my God to thee. Near to thee. Home, um, which I wasn't intending to read now, but I, I'm switching slightly. Um, there's a, a word in Irish. It's 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 called it's a poem to to the blue people. Um, and black people. And I, I'll ruin it if I say it. One should not tell everything about a poem. Maybe. But there's a word in Irish that black people are not called black people, right? You know, that they're, they're not called, what's the word for black in Irish? Fardov, they wouldn't be called Fardov. Do you understand me? Well, far would be man, black man. They're called something else. There's an intangible lazulite blue, a sheen that glistens of fresh fallen snow, something akin but not quite the same as you see shine off the back of a barn swallow, the abdominal of a regular blue bottle fly, the obsidian clear night sky, the teal of an oil slick, or the halo of a gas stove flame, till visiting Soweto I realize it is the hint, glint, light, shimmering of people on white. Finally making sense of why a black man in Irish is called on far Gorham, the blue man. Um, I, I wrote one of the books in the clip, one of the books is, was a book called The Hell Box. <coughs> My father was a compositor. Um, and you know, the composer used to set the type back to front, and I he used to set the type again. It's a, it's a lost world, uh, you know. Um, and part, of course, the hell box is full of lingo that's a lost world. The printers would use words like the hell box itself was where they threw the, the type to be melted down and recast broken type or the worn type. Of course that's a metaphor for us all, we have to keep remaking ourselves, a me metaphor for the melting pot of America as an immigrant, a metaphor for language, you know, it's fabulous. Metaphor, right? It took me nearly 40 years to figure out, you know, I'm 35, that it was a good metaphor. I mean, it just struck me, why, why, why didn't I get to this a bit earlier? Um, but, you know, and it was, a, I was lucky, but I used to, I grew up in <coughs> the hell box, I mean, I, would, I mean, the hell box, but yes, I did, I grew up in the hell box. Um, the hell box was Cork in Ireland, and the, the particular hell box was on Southgate, uh, so, um, on Oliver Plunkett Street, Eagle Printing Company, some people from Cork here. Um, and um, so this is the first poem from it, and there's some jargon, and I use the jargon, and in a way, I mean, the jargon is gone, but the jargon, because it, people say, why, did, why am I using language? That's gone. It's exactly the reason why I'm using it. Because, first of all, because I like it, and I love it, and I get a kick out of it, but also because it's about mutability, and, you know, we'll all be gone ourselves. Uh, and that's all right, too. I don't mean to be here sort of as a bell ringer, but also the species will be gone, and the planet at some point. I know this is kind of basic, you know this, but, you know. <coughs> um, excuse me for um, reminding us. 
We'd have a drink now afterwards. <laughs> and we're going to read the bird poems after this. Um, um, but anyway, but there's ten arms also that have come into the language that we don't know has come from printing, like mind your P's and Q's. You know, because the P and the Q in, in the printing set would be inverted. They were not run, they were inverted and upside down. They could read upside down and back to front. And um, those kind of things, you know, things come into language and why do they come into language? And we use them without knowing why. The, 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 the compositor. Perhaps it's the smell of printing ink. Sets me off out of memory's jumbled font. Or maybe it's the printer's lingo as he relates how phrases came about. How, for instance, mind your P's and Q's has as much to do with pints and quarts and the printers were known for drink as it has to do with those descenders. But I don't say anything about how I discovered where widows and orphans and out of sorts came from. The day my father unnoticed and unexpectedly set 30 on the bottom of his compositor's page and left me mystified about the origins of that end, how to measure a line gauge, and how, since he was forced to go, he slowly, and without a word, turned from himself into everyone. As we turn into that last zero before t finally passing on to the stone man. And then, finish up. Um, how are we doing for time? Can you edit some of this? <laughs> Good. Um, it's hard to do a double reading. Um, the next poem is a poem called The Alien. A poem I, I think if I had to name, if somebody, you know, it's one of my, it's certainly one or two, two or three of my favorite poems. Not because of the subject matter, because I think it's a good poem for me. Do you understand? Um, but like everything else, like everybody that writes and stuff, you know, you, you, know, you have your favorites. And you, but of course, the others start crying out then and you're in trouble. <laughs> um, again, it's about a page long. And it's to a child in the ultrasound, looking at the child in the ultrasound. I'm back again, scrutinizing the Milky Way of your ultrasound, scanning the dark matter, the nothingness that now the heads say is chock-a-block with quarks and squarks, gravitons and gravitini, photons and fortinos, or sprout who aren't there inside the spacecraft of your ma, the time capsule of this printout hurling and whirling towards us. It's all daft on this earth, or alien who art in the heavens, or Martian, or little green man. We are anxious to make contact, to ask divers questions about the heavendom you hail from, to discuss the whole shebang of the beginning and end, the pre-Big Bang on time before you forget the why and lie of thy first place. And, or friend, to say welcome, that we mean no harm, we'd die for you even. That we pray you're not here to subdue us. That 
We'd put away our ray guns, missiles, attitude, and share our world with you, little big head. If only you stay. Um, short poem. Would you like to tell anyone that you would like me to read? I mean, I have a poem. It's not enough, I'm not to embarrass you, know that. I'm not. Okay, okay. But, but I'm just not in the. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry, that's not fair. It didn't mean it like that, though. An extra drink after for you. <laughs> short poem. This morning, a waiter in a dingy cafe was baffled by my attempt at his language. Everyone chimed in to translate, all strangers. The waiter got it, smiled, and everyone smiled. For a moment, it was as if a great problem was solved as if each registered the answer we forgot we knew. The froth of goodwill bubbling up like cappuccino. I should read a cock poem, shouldn't I? Um, I'm going to read a longish poem now before well, actually, I finish up. No, I finish up with Asal Dama, which will make sense. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Striped Ink, which is one of one. But it, this is again one of the printing poems, printing um, head box poems, and um, it's a poem being sent on a fool's errand. Fools aren't. If you were in, they don't, they don't do these kind of things so much anymore. They used to do them all the time when, well, when I was when I was working in places. If you were in a construction site, for instance, they'd send you for a glass hammer. No, right? Um, but in in printing in printing it, it was a, a tin of striped ink. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, I was, you know, by 14 working on the floor was all the compositors. So, but there's a lot of allusions to American, I mean, uh, Irish mythology, um, and, um, you know, Fionn, when he touches the fish by accident, he, he knows everything. Fionn is a mythological character in Irish. Um, for, uh, myth. Anyway. You'll get it. Strike think. I'm smack dab in the old tabula rasa days, bamboozled by the books adults bow over, musing if their eyes light upon the white or black spaces. A boyhood later, still rent small on the top story of the Eagle Printing Company. I see books pour out and believe that if I fish in them, I'll catch the salmon of knowledge, tall tale to us at school, out of the river of words. And like Fionn, I'll taste my burning hand and Abracadabra, I'll fathom what's below the surface. But if I'm burnt, it's later that day, and my first day as page boy, spaced from fixing leads. The devils, Fred and Dummy, typesetting a new book, dispatch me down to Christy Collin on the box floor for a tin of striped ink. I take the bait and watch floors of laboring women and men flit by, caught 
in the lift's mesh of X's. Drowned out by the machine's hollow blue. Somehow, between floors, the elevator comes out and I'm stuck on my message that I still haven't gotten on to. Seamus Heaney has a poem, the spirit level about it, but he cops the mind. This poem was written before that, but that's not, do you understand? It's an interesting twist. That's all. But, um, um, so, I'll finish up, so. But, um, I'll do um, one of the other, one of the poems from the new book. Short poem. It's being misprinted in board books, bought and collected, and this. Something wrong. Don't program me. The shopping for a composter. Brace yourself. Rooting around what's in. The, sorry, shopping for a composter. They should be to my mother in this. It makes, it's important to touch them. The poem normally. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, dedications aren't important that important, though I always did, or, 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 or they are important, you know, sometimes you're dedicating because it adds a, a dimension to the poem, but anyway. Rooting around what simply looked like refuse bins, I sounded out the petite clerk. Opening an exhibit, she picked up a, a rotting fruit to expose worms covering the flesh. She talked of them naturally, endearingly even. I'll try to take a leave from this woman who spoke of the mass of blood red worms as if it was a rose, and you fresh in the grave, and I, unable to help, picture you in your coffin dark, covered with such a posy all the way from your Roman nose to your pedicured toes. Um, and now, just two more. I'll read The Ship of Bart itself, the title poem of this. And then one short poem, then after that one. Right? Okay. This is a page in a bit. Look out, it's my longest poem tonight. <laughs> for months, your crib is docked, waiting for you, laden with a shower of gifts, hand-knit boots with suede soles, mounting drifts of rompers, bibs, hats, and a slew of other offerings laid on your ship of bath, with the ark story embroidered all about this birth. The creatures have mostly mirthful faces, the cashinating chickadees, the stout stoat, the grinning elephant trunk bailing the boat, the trowel owl, the odd rainbow trout, the one-humped camel you might think is pregnant on his back, the polar bear yodeling upon a melting green berg, the avongler ant not to speak of the circus of unrecorded creatures on your kid attire. Is this saying unbeknownst to us that we gather around the baby, the great circus of the earth, the flying hippopotamus, the fetus-like manatee, the dark stark, the delirious giraffe, not just for a sappy laugh, but to illuminate their dearth and our sapien dodoing as we fish mount, sorry, 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 sorry. Or little lantern, waxwing, lockling, all the cordial choir are Noah calling you now. The love lice, the leech of paradise, the how now down cow, the forever gone bird, the dolly sheep, the flying kiwi, the crying with laughter jackass, 
the pronghorn, the bristleless porcupine, the schizophrenic platypus, the licorice black crow, the rhinoceros, that ancestor of the unicorn with an overgrown thorn horn. Listen, the horns, the horns are blowing, trumpeting you or dare you, corn, beckoning you unto the ark out of your first watery dark. Hurry now, hurry now, baritones the polar bear, our icebergs are melting out here. Quack, quack, the duck sections quack. Darn, darn, Basso bleeds the goat, stomping time with his hoof as the chorus raises the roof. All aboard, all aboard, or poor wee barn. Or that should have been quick, quick, the duck sections quack, but I got over, I got over. So one more poem from this, and then I'm going to finish up with, with a very short poem from the Greek anthology, which are much more interesting for me now. Writers of poems are much more interested in what they write now, even if it's far more inferior to what they've written before. They think it's good now. Do you understand? So I think it's good now. And that's all right for me. And you don't have to put up with it. But I'm going to finish off the last poem poem set in Cork, and Aseldama was the la was the little, uh, it's a poem about complicity, as it runs through the whole collective, really. Um, but um, it's a quote, Aseldama was the field that they bought from, with the 40 pieces of silver, you know, when, when Judas, when he threw them on the ground back. <coughs> there's a quote, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, and there's, there are songs like Beautiful City, that they all, they all sing in Cork. My mother would. Asaldama, and then the, the quote is King James Bible from Matthew. And Judas cast down the piece of silver in the temple and departed. And the priests and elders took counsel and brought with the pieces of silver the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field has been called the field of blood unto this day. Which is Asaldama. We drove down what seemed the curve of the earth, sandwiched in our Ford Anglia. We were happy as the colours of our beach ball, a careless car full of mirth and sing-along songs. Songs that were mostly as sappy as the soppy tomato sandwiches sprinkled with sand. Which is why they're called sandwiches, our father said, sandwiched himself now in the ground between his mother and ours. What's the meaning of day? Which one of us children asked that as we passed the spot with the lit steel cross on Carr's Hill? Putting the kibash on the next sun, our mother about to break into beautiful city. She crossed herself, saying, that's the place they bury those whose lives somehow went wrong. Betrayed in one way or other, without a sound to their names or a name, everyone buried together and alone without a headstone. The crepuscular loneliness of the field shrouded or bright time. Our world, the city below, shimmered like the silver pieces scattered on the dark floor of the temple. And then just to finish up, from the Greek anthology, that great next book written by all those other characters who are not me. This one is by Longleaf. Same Greek and thing, to finish up. Another time, and thank you for sitting here. I wouldn't have gone so long, but I had to go a bit longer because of the recording. So I hope you weren't, it's okay for you. Another time. A man played a squeeze box in a pub. That's one of the old types. Lyceum of another time. 
he braille buttons the melodion, squeezes life back into a warm tune with sure lightning skill. People jaw away around the bar. No one pays heed to this avatar. The air necromanced into music. Not even the player himself knows how good he is. The tragedy is not so much that nobody notices a god, but that the gods don't even know they are gods.